For week 8, we'll be exploring small sample confidence intervals for the population mean, confidence intervals for proportions, and also what's the minimum sample size we need when constructing a confidence interval. Um, basically, just more on confidence intervals. For part 1, we'll explore just the small sample confidence intervals for mu. We already explored confidence intervals when we have a large sample, but what happens if we want to do a confidence interval for the population mean when we have a small sample, or less than 30? So why sample size actually matters. If we have a small sample, which again in this class we'll define as being less than 30, the central limit theorem doesn't apply. Um, in other words, with the central limit theorem, if you have a large sample, you know the sampling distribution of sample means, x bars, are going to be normal no matter what the population looks like. But if, the central, but if we have a small sample, the central limit theorem doesn't apply. So we need to know that the population itself is at least mound-shaped and symmetrical or you know, perfectly normal would be ideal, in order to know that the sampling distribution of x bar is also normal. Um, in other words, uh, just drawing this out with a picture, if we start off with a normal distribution, and this is just our population of x values, so like individual people, so if this is what our population looks like, then no matter what the sample size is, our sampling distribution of x bars will also be normal, um, because the idea is the larger the sample size, the more normal this distribution becomes, but if it's starting out normal, it's going to end off normal. Um, also, if we have a small sample, we have another problem as well. The sample standard deviation we use to estimate the population standard deviation before, but if we have a small sample, that approximation is not going to be very good. Um, the idea is that on average, S is considered an unbiased estimator for sigma, meaning on average it will be correct. But it does vary a lot. So, you know, um, maybe if the population standard deviation is 10, in one sample you might find it being 8, and in another sample you might find the sample standard deviation to be 12. It could vary a lot. And this variation is going to increase um, really this standard error, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of x bar if we use it to approximate sigma. Um, I know this sounds very confusing. I'm trying to be very correct with what I'm saying here, but um, we can simplify this. But the idea here is that we have two problems when we have small samples. S doesn't work very well as an approximation for sigma. And also, we need to know the population itself is normal since the central limit theorem won't apply. So um, let's tackle these problems. Um, so a few different situations are possible. If the population is normal, which means we know the sampling distribution will be normal, and we know sigma, so we know the population standard deviation, then we can calculate our confidence interval for mu in the same way as before, just the x bar plus or minus the z alpha over 2 sigma over square root of n. And that works out, you know, great. It's the same formula for before. Nothing's different except for the fact that we need to know the population was normal. And if we don't know it, we could just assume it. But, of course, you know what they say when one assumes. Um, if the population is normal and we don't know sigma, so we have to use S instead, our sample standard deviation instead, then we can calculate our confidence interval for mu. Um, for a small sample, but we have to use what's called the t-distribution instead of the z-distribution. Um, so the formula will look the same, except for instead of z, we'll have a t over here. Not a big deal, just a slightly different distribution. Um, the third scenario is if we know our population is not normal, or if we just don't feel comfortable assuming that it is, then we need to use a different procedure, and it's beyond the scope of this class, but there are certain things that you can do. Um, if you look up things like non-parametric statistics and things like that, there are stuff you can do to handle the situation, but we're not going to cover it in this class. All right, um, so let's explore this whole t-distribution thing. Um, so the story goes that William Gossett recognized, and this is, um, oh gosh, like over 100 years ago now, uh, recognized that the sampling distribution of x bar will be wider than we estimate it if we're using s instead of sigma. And he wasn't even specifying small samples or large samples, because truth is, this is always true. If we're using S instead of sigma, it's going to cause the distribution to be a little off. Um, so uh, he published his distribution under the pen name of student. 
Um, the story goes is that uh, he wasn't allowed to publish under his own name while working for a company, so he published it under the name student instead. So it's actually a capital S for student, student's T distribution. Um, I don't know if that story is true or not, but that's that's what I've heard. Well, anyway, so um, this T distribution requires a calculation of what's called degrees of freedom. So um, degrees of freedom um, for our purposes is just going to be our sample size minus one. So if we have a sample of 15 people, our degrees of freedom will be 14. Um, the T distribution, as far as what it looks like, it looks a lot like the normal distribution, um, but it's going to be shorter and fatter. So um, like if we have a degrees of freedom of four, meaning our sample size is five, it'll look like this yellow distribution where the blue one is the normal distribution. But you see they're both mound shaped and symmetrical, but the T distribution is shorter and fatter. Um, but as the sample size increases, so if, if we had a sample size of 21, so the degrees of freedom would be like 20, you can see we now have this red curve, which looks pretty close to the blue curve. And by a sample size of 30 or 40, it looks almost identical. Um, so that's why we were able to use the Z distribution in the last section when we had a large sample. So here's the T table. It comes right after um, the Z table in your textbook. It's in the appendices. And um, the idea here is you need to, if you're generating a 90% confidence interval, 90, 90%, um, you know your alpha over 2 value would be 0.05. So we'd go down this column. And if we had a sample size of, what did I say, I think 15, then our degrees of freedom would be 14. And our T value would be 1.761. One thing I'd like to point out is that on this very last line of the t-table, it shows a degrees of freedom of infinity. And this is what we're talking about when we have a large sample. And if you look at the bottom, these are our z values. Um, our z of, uh, for a 95% confidence interval, so alpha over 2 being 0.025, was 1.96, and that's what it tells us. So this very last line of the t-table is actually the z values that we care about. Okay, um, moving on, let's look at an example. Well, we know IQ scores are supposed to follow a normal distribution. Um, so suppose eight random engineers were given an IQ test. And suppose the average of those eight engineers was 118.5 with a standard deviation of 9.2. Let's create a 95% confidence interval for the IQs of all engineers, or the average IQ for all engineers. So let's identify some of the important information. First off, our sample size is 8, our sample average x bar is 118.5, and our sample standard deviation is 9.2. Um, since we know the population of IQ scores is normal, because that was the first sentence, but we don't know the population standard deviation, we only know the sample standard deviation, we have to use the t-distribution since we have a small sample. And again, if so... You're going to use the t distribution for this class if you don't know s, you have a small sample, and you know the population is normal. So only if all those three things are true um, are you going to use um, the t distribution for this course. And so this is our formula. Um, the only difference is that we have t instead of z here. So let's work out the solution. Um, we're going to use the t-table, and um, sorry, looking at our formula, let's go back for a moment. Uh, looking at our formula, we know all the values. We know s, we know n, we know x bar. We don't know t, so to get the t, we need to go to the table. Um, so to use the table, we need to know alpha over 2. We need to know the degrees of freedom. All right, since we're generating a 95% confidence interval, so that's our confidence level, that means alpha would be 1 minus that, which is 5%. And then dividing that by 2 gives us 2.5% or 0.025. So we're going to go down the 0.025 column. Now our sample size was 8. So if we just do 8 minus 1, that gives us our degrees of freedom, which is 7. So we're going to go down the 7th row and the, eighth, and the 0.025 column. So 0.025 is over here. And then our degrees of freedom being 7 is over here. <clears throat> Matching those up we get 2.365. So our T alpha over 2 is just 2.365. Okay, let's finish this calculation. Uh, to remind you of the numbers, 
we have n is 8, x bar is 118.5, and our standard deviation is 9.2. Plugging these into our formula, we get 118.5 plus or minus 2.365 times 9.2 over the square root of 8. And I took out a calculator and I got that the margin of error is about 7.7 .7 approximately. So I do 118.5 uh, plus or minus 7.7 .7 gives me 110.8 to 126.2. To practically interpret this, we could say that we have to include our measure of reliability. We are 95% confident that the true mean or true average IQ of all engineers falls in that interval. Falls, in, falls between 110.8 points and 126.2 points. And by the way, this was completely made up data. I have no idea what the actual average is. Okay, um, just to summarize which distribution to use when we're dealing with a confidence interval for mu. If n is greater than or equal to three, uh, 30, you're going to use the z distribution. You don't need to make any assumptions about the population. Um, all you need is that for your sample to be random, um, and our sample size needs to be uh, greater than or equal to 30, we could use the z-distribution, no problem. Um, and we can use s instead of sigma without too much of a problem if we don't know sigma. All right, if n is less than 30 and the population is normal, because we need the population to be normal in order to know what that sampling distribution looks like. So um, we can use the z-distribution as long as we know the population standard deviation sigma. This is really never going to happen in practice. So even though academically this is true, you're not really going to see it. Um, well, if n is less than 30 and the population is normal, but we don't know sigma, so we have to use t. I'm sorry, we, we have to use s instead of sigma. We have to use the t-distribution instead. Um, most commonly in practice when you have small samples, you're going to use the t-distribution. Now, if n is less than 30 and the population is not normal, or maybe we don't know it and we don't want to assume it's normal, then we can't use any of the methods from this course, and you'll have to just do something else or make an assumption you're uncomfortable with.